Chapter 35, Financial Economics. Okay. So up until this chapter, we've been talking about investment in the terms of economic investment. So um, buying new capital or replacing old capital with new capital stock. So, for example, a business will replace their construction equipment or buy more construction equipment or expand their plants. Now we're going to go into financial investment. And this is when an asset is bought or built for a financial gain. And this could be, for example, buying a house for financial gain. It could be buying a stock for financial gain, a bond. Um, it could be buying a comic book collection for financial gain, etc. So it includes economic investment plus um, real assets like like mentioned before, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, etc. Okay. Present value helps us determine how much we should pay today for an asset. Okay. It takes into account the future expected returns or costs and helps calculate what the price would be today. And then using that price today, we can see if purchasing the asset would be a good investment. Okay. Compound interest is when we are earning interest on previously earned interest, and this needs to be taken into account in order to calculate present value. So let's say we have $100 today, and interest is 8%. So in one year, okay, we'd have 100 times 1 plus... 0.08 okay and what we get is 108 in year one okay and then in year two okay we're going to earn eight percent interest not only on the original hundred but also on the eight dollars interest we earned in the year before so year two okay we get $116.64 and then in year three okay, we would earn 8% interest on the 116.64 and we get 125.97 okay and so on okay so if buying an asset then this can be you know at an estimated 8% return then investors can calculate how much they would have at the end of each year or if someone is borrowing money at a certain interest rate, this could calculate how much they would owe, how much interest they owe on their loan. And just a side note here, because of compound interest, because we are earning interest on previously earned interest, leaving your money in the asset for long periods of time can lead to really big gains. Okay, so in the present value model, we can rearrange the formula, um, which was the future value last slide, and get, okay, future expected value, over here is x divided by 1 plus the interest rate to the t power, t's, and that uh, stands for number of years, and then you can get the present value of that future amount. So this formula can help us determine how much we should pay for an asset today. So this asset yields future payments. Let's say there's a asset that is guaranteed to pay $370 in 17 years. Okay, so let's say interest is 8%. Okay, and what we get is a hundred dollars. Okay, so now we know that an investor would not pay more than a hundred dollars for this asset. 
because they could invest $100 and in another investment that could give them 8% return. And we also know that whoever is selling this asset wouldn't accept less than $100 since they know that investors can only get the same return if they spend $100 on another asset. The asset price okay, should equal the total present value of all the future payments. Okay, so it's the sum of all the present values of all the assets future payments. So if we were to go down the list of what the asset would be worth all those 17 years, okay, and do the present value of those amounts, then if you added them up, they should equal to be 100. Okay, so a lot of times, you know, if someone wins a lottery, they have a choice to either get paid out over a number of years or just take a lump sum. And the lump sum will be less than the total they would get paid out over a number of years. So, you know, let's say you win the $100 million jackpot. So you can either get paid $5 million per year for 20 years or you can take a lump sum value. And the way they calculate that lump sum value is using the formula of present value. So they can do 100000 I mean, excuse me, 100 million divided by one plus, let's say, interest rate is 5% over 20 years. Okay, and they would get that the present value of $100 million, okay, at 5% interest is $62,311,000. $51. Okay. So you could either accept this amount today as a lump sum, or you could just slowly get paid out over a number of years. A lot of economists would say, you know, take the lump sum today and then diversify it and invest it and by investing it in different places. Also, salary caps. Um, in the sports world, there's a salary cap. Um, which is a limit that each team can spend on salaries. And this is done to keep things more fair because richer teams could outbid poorer teams for better players, and so they always stay the richer, better team. And so to prevent that, make things more fair, they have a salary cap. And so what ends up happening here is that a player might accept a lower salary the first year in order for the team because they know the team has to meet a salary cap and then the second year they'll get paid a much higher salary and usually it's what they would have earned plus what the player agreed to give up the first year plus an added amount of interest for that okay so popular investment which we will see in the next few slides stocks bonds mutual funds and the three features is that you must pay to acquire them. They have to offer the chance to receive a future payment, and there's also a risk involved. Okay, so stocks, usually the riskiest asset anyone can buy. When you buy a stock, you are part owner of a company. So you buy Coca-Cola stock, then you are part owner in Coca-Cola. Even if it's 0.001% in okay, case stake in ownership, you still are an ownership in that company and you know firms do go bankrupt I mean we saw in the great recession 07 08 many went bankrupt or in the dot-com burst bubble burst in 2001 go bankrupt however there is a limited liability rule and that's that the maximum amount of money that shareholders can lose is what they paid for their shares okay and so shareholders don't have to make up the difference of what firms that go bankrupt owe. However, if the firm does well and they earn a profit, then they are subject 
to earn financially, either through capital gains, so they can sell their stock um, for the higher price than the, what they paid for and pocket the difference, or they can keep the stock and then receive a dividend. And dividend is usually when a firm split out the profit, so each share of stock, for example, may pay like a $2 dividend. Bonds are usually less risky than stocks. And because of this, they also usually offer a lower rate of interest. Stocks, you know, they're riskier, but they usually offer a greater rate of return. Bonds, less risky, lower rate of return. And it's a debt contract issued by government and corporations. So there is a possibility of default where the corporation or government fails to make a payment that they promised. It, the possibility of default is higher with corporation or corporate bonds than it is with government bonds. Um, it's very unlikely the U.S. government will ever default on its debt. And the investor, you know, they buy, let's say, a $1,000 bond for 10 years. What they do is they'll receive interest payments. It can be monthly. Usually it's semi-annual payments. And then at the end of the 10 years, they'll receive the full thousand dollars back. Mutual funds, okay, is a company and they maintain a portfolio of other stocks or bonds. So a lot of companies that manage um, retirement money for people, they buy mutual funds, and it's usually a diversified portfolio. So some riskier, riskier assets, like we said, stocks, and then some safer assets like bonds okay so index funds are passively managed funds and what index funds are is that they're a portfolio and they're selected to exactly match a stock or bond index so if you buy an index fund with the standard and pores that matches the standard and pores 500 index then you'll automatically have some shares of stock in the 500 largest stocks currently trading. Okay, but they're passively managed because since they're already pre-selected to match the index, then, you know, there's no active buying and selling of those stocks within that fund. Whereas actively managed funds, okay, I call this a little bit more a la carte in, you know, a investment manager is constantly buying and selling stocks and bonds to try to get you the highest rate of return. Okay, so the 10 largest mutual funds of, of March 2013, you can see PIMCO here with 179, almost $180 billion in assets. Then, you know, you have the S&P over here, Vanguard, and then so on. Investment returns are stated as a percentage. Um, so if it's positive, it's a gain. If it's negative, it's a loss. And it's you can calculate it by dividing the gain or loss by the purchase price. So for example, if you buy a house for let's say three hundred thousand dollars and you can sell it for four hundred thousand dollars then you would calculate this by taking the gain and that would be a hundred thousand dollars it's the difference dividing it by what you initially pay for the house of three hundred thousand and you'll get a gain of thirty three and a third percent. Also, if, for example, you decide to rent your house instead, then what you can do is what you expect to earn in rent in a certain period of time divided by the purchase price. So, for example, let's say you bought the house for $300,000 and you expect to earn uh, $20,000 in rent for that, if you rent it out for that year, okay, then we would divide 
300,000 by 20,000. And we get that your rate of return in this case would be 6.67%. Okay. An important thing to note here is that the rate of return is inversely related to price. Okay, and let's do an example of this. Okay, so let's say you buy a stock for $1,000 and you plan to get $200 rate of return this year. So, uh, excuse me. Okay, so 200 divided by 1,000. Okay, and we have 20% rate of return. But let's say the stock price were to go up to 1,200, then rate of return, in this case, would drop to 16.67%. Okay, so as price of the asset goes up or the investment goes up, rate of return goes down and vice versa. Okay. Okay, so sometimes in the market there are differences in assets that are identical. So let's say asset A is identical to asset B, but asset a is lower in price than asset B, and so an investor might want to buy asset A and then sell it at a higher price since asset B is identical and selling for a higher price. Okay, so buying something for a lower price and trying to sell it or flip it, you know, at a higher price to get a return is called arbitrage. Okay, and what this does in the long run is it actually leads to an average expected return on the assets because what happens is when we are buying um, assets then the price goes up and we saw that when the price goes up rate of return goes down and when we sell assets the price of that asset goes down and we saw that when the price of the asset goes down rates of return go up. Okay, so let's say there's two companies that have similar prospects and they're selling iPhone case covers and they're public and you know, they're issuing stock. Let's say company A stock gives 5% return and company B stock gives 10% return. At first, investors will be buying um, shares of company B because the rate of return is higher. However, this will bid up the stock price since demand for that stock is higher and the rate of return for company B will start to fall. And investors who own stock in lower return company A will begin to sell their stock, right? Because they want to buy stock in company B. Company B has a higher rate of return. but since they're selling stock they own in company A, the stock price goes down since demand shifts to the left and their rate of return in company A goes up. And this continues until both company A and company B offer an equal rate of return. So risk for some assets is very uncertain, especially for stocks. And one way to minimize risk is by diversifying. If you ever heard the term, don't put your eggs all in one basket, okay? It's referring to diversification. Now, diversifiable risk, okay? So let's say, for example, I only own Apple stock, okay? If Apple goes under, then my loss will be great. I have a lot of risk because all my money will then be lost. And this happened with people who only own, for example, Enron stock. When Enron went under, they lost everything. So in order to minimize my risk, 
I buy other stocks and I might even buy bonds, for example. So let's say I buy a hundred different stocks and then I'll buy, you know, a few government bonds and then also put money in my savings account. Okay. Then my risk has dropped okay, because I am very diversified now. So if Apple were to go under, okay, I have other stocks and bonds that can keep me afloat. Okay, so diversifiable risk is risk that can be minimized with diversification. Now, non-diversifiable risk, you know, this can also be called market risk, and this is a risk that cannot be reduced with diversification. This is a risk that the economy uh, as a whole will crash, and so you might own 100 stocks, but you know if the economy and stock market were to crash, then you could lose everything because um, all of the stocks will go down. You know, this is very vulnerable to the business cycles. You know, in 07, 08, even diversified portfolios were exposed to non-diversifiable risk because as uncertainty in the market grew and as more and more companies were at risk of going bankrupt, there was a huge stock market sell-off and so most of the stocks were in the red. Okay, so the two big decisions in buying an asset are rates of return and also risk because more risk averse people um, will take a lower rate of return in order for reduced risk and then people who are less sensitive to risk would accept a higher rate of return in exchange for higher risk okay so you know the two standard measures are the average expected rate of return and the average expected rate of return is the weighted average of the investment's possible future rates of return. Okay, and it's really named probability weighted average because it's not a guaranteed rate of return, but it's, you know, what's the highest probability that it would get, for example, 10% rate of return. So let's say if it's a 75% probability, I'll get a 10% rate of return, then I'll be... Uh, 0.75 times 10%, and let's say a 25% probability I'll get 15% rate of return, then they'll add that number to 15 times 0.25, and that would be the average expected rate of return. So it would be 10 times 0.75 plus 15 times point. Okay, and we get that the weighted average expected rate of return is 11.25%. Okay, and so usually what we see is that higher rates of return, average expected rate of return, usually implies higher risk as well. Um, but however, investors look at a second measure called the beta okay and the beta is a relative measure of non-diversifiable risk more specifically it measures how the non-diversifiable risk of an asset or portfolio of assets compares with that of the market portfolio now the market portfolio contains every asset available in the financial markets so it is diversified as much as possible so since it's diversified as much as possible, the market portfolio only exposes is exposed to non-diversifiable risk. So it is used as a benchmark. So the beta is set at a 1.0. The 1.0 represents the market portfolio's non-diversifiable risk. Okay, so if an asset has a beta of 0.5, then what it's saying is that its non-diversifiable risk is only half of that possessed by the market portfolio. If an asset has a beta of 2.0, then it has twice as much of non-diversifiable risk as the market portfolio. Okay, so the beta uses the market portfolio as the benchmark in which to compare all other assets to. Okay. As stated before, that 
the higher the average expected rate of return is, the higher the risk involved is. There it's a positive relationship. And the lower the average expected rate of return is, the lower the risk. Short-term U.S. government bonds are considered to have a rate of return that is risk-free. Okay. And when we say short-term, it means bonds that measure anywhere from 4 weeks to 26 weeks. And it's risk-free because there's very, 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 very little chance that the U.S. government would not be able to repay back these bonds. Okay. U.S. government's very diversified. They can quickly shift assets or increase taxes or whatever they need to do in order to pay back these short-term bonds. However, even though they're risk-free, the rate of return they pay is greater than zero. And that is because they are compensating people for their time preference. Okay, and this is time preference refers to the fact that we rather spend our money today than tomorrow. We don't like delaying consumption. And so in order for us to be able to delay our consumption and not spend money, we need something in return. So the government, you know, in order to be able to sell their bonds to the public, they know that the public needs to get Hey, they need to get compensated for their time. And so that's why they do offer a rate of return that is greater than zero. So that rate of return is known as the risk-free interest rate. Okay, so the International Country Risk Guide takes into account political, economic, and financial risk of each country. Okay, and so countries with a higher number are safer and companies with a lower number are riskier and so you can see Norway is around 90 so they're a very safe country if you buy a Norwegian country bond then you know most very most likely you'll get your money back whereas if you buy a Somalian bond you know you might not necessarily get paid back they are considered very high risk since they are below 50 the security market line shows how compensation is determined for all assets, no matter what the risk levels are. So it's, you know, we're seeing that the average expected rate of return is the rate that compensates for time preference plus the rate that compensates for risk. And we can simplify this to average expected rate of return is equal to the risk-free interest rate because, as we stated a couple slides back, that the rate in risk-free uh, bonds is considered the risk-free interest rate, okay, because it's purely compensating people for just their time, and then plus any risk premium, and that's the rate that compensates for risk. Okay, so we can see here that the market portfolio Okay, is the benchmark where non-diversifiable risk is zero. Okay. And so the risk level here measured by beta is 1.0. Okay. And so anything that's greater than 1.0 okay, indicates non-diversifiable risk. That is greater than the market portfolio, and then a beta less than one indicates non diversifiable risk that is less than the market portfolio. Okay, and then we see here that the compensation for time preference, okay, and determines the risk free interest rate. Okay, so a short-term U.S. government bond and risk-free asset would be right here because it is only earning the risk-free interest rate. It's, you know, holders of these bonds are only being compensated for their time. Okay. But as we see here, as we move to higher betas, okay, then we are acquiring risk. Okay. And so... The difference is here, okay, okay, 
is the interest rates that investor is earning because they are being compensated for taking on higher and higher risks. Okay, so what we end up seeing is that the higher the beta, it means the higher the risk, and therefore the higher rates of return. Okay, so an investor here is earning not only the risk-free interest rate, but also a higher interest rate to compensate for taking on a lot of risk over here because the beta over here is higher than your standard beta of one. Okay, so the more risk an investor takes on, the higher average rate of return that they can expect to earn. Okay, so the security market line will determine the rates of return. So let's say Okay, an investment has a risk level of beta X, okay, then they will earn rate of return Y. Let's say they have a beta Z, okay, then they will earn, okay, a higher rate of return that is Z. And of course, if they have a beta of zero, let me choose a different color, okay, then they will only earn the risk-free interest rate over here. Okay, so the higher the beta, the higher average rate of return that can be expected. Okay, and it can also demonstrate arbitrage. Okay, so what ends up happening is we can see here that investment A earns a higher average rate of return than investment C. Okay. So what ends up happening is investors buy A and the price of asset A goes up, which reduces its rate of return. Because remember, price of the asset has an inverse relationship with its rate of return. So the higher the price goes, the lower the rate of return. So investors buy asset A because it earns more. This increases the price of the asset. So the rate of return falls and then they sell asset C because it doesn't earn a higher rate of return and so this reduces the price of asset C which then increases the rate of return and then they normalize here at B okay and so the average rate of return is Y for both assets okay. So the Federal Reserve, you know, through open market operations can influence interest rates. And so they can increase the risk-free rate. Let's say they undergo contractionary monetary policy that decreases money supply. And so before, okay, their risk-free interest rate was over here, IF1, okay. They conducted contractionary monetary policy risk-free interest rate increased and this shifts the security market line parallel and up. So all interest rates rise. So before, you know, interest rate was here and now the new interest rate for a certain risk level beta X is higher. You know, let's say if it was old interest rate Okay, for this asset it was level Z, and then after the Fed raised rates, the new rate of return is Z2, etc. Okay, so the Fed's expansionary monetary policy um, in the recession of 0708 led to lower interest rates, so the security market line actually shifted downward. Okay, and, and it actually became steeper, the slope increased, because there was so much uncertainty that in order for investors to take on additional risk, they wanted a higher than normal compensation. And so what ended up happening is a lot of investors sold their stocks, stock prices fell, 
and uh, they went to buying government bonds because they were much safer and risk-free, despite the fact that the risk-free interest rate had fallen due to expansionary monetary policy. That's just how scared investors were at that time. Okay, this concludes chapter 35.